Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 181. Today we are turning back the clock to talk about two of my favorite eras, the 1950s, and, well, the second one is going to be a surprise. I'll tell you a little later in the show when I introduce our new Genealogy Gems Book Club featured title. But first, we're going to talk a little news from a new Google innovation to two new record collections online that fill in a hole in American documentary history. I'll read some mail from you about the new Ancestry site and family history blogging. So let's head to the genealogy news. Now, wouldn't it be great if your smartphone alerted you that you left your keys or your eyeglasses behind before you're leaving the house? Well, believe it or not, Google is working on it (laughs) based on a recent patent that Google has filed. Now, the patent describes a device that uses short-range wireless technology to link your smartphone with other must-have items like your wallet, your keys, or your glasses. Yes, I desperately need this. (laughs) The idea is that if you leave a location with one of those items, but you leave one of the other ones behind, an alarm is going to go off. Now, there was a commentary on the Venture Beat website that explained about this. They said, um, the user can control the amount of distance between the mobile device and the paired object that must exist before an alarm goes off. They can also control the type of alarm as well as how often the device checks to see if the paired objects remain nearby, unquote. Well, I think this is really cool. And you know, In one way, it really kind of makes me think that Google is taking its alerts kind of out of cyberspace and right into our daily lives to help them run more smoothly. And hopefully, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you are using Google alerts, right? (laughs) Setting up a Google alert lets you find out about all the new content that comes online as it's becoming available. This is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I love setting them up on my favorite keyword searches, you know, stuff that I'm always looking for. I use Google Alerts to automate my online genealogy searches and, of course, follow up on any other favorite topics that I happen to be following at the time. Now, if this doesn't sound familiar to you, you're not using Google Alerts, you can learn more about Google Alerts and how to search for things like patents, like the one I was just talking about, for household items and and inventions that kind of shaped our relatives' lives. And you can learn about this in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. We also talk about Google Alerts on the Genealogy Gems blog. If you head to the website, genealogygems.com, and type in Google Alerts in the search box, you'll be able to read more there about it as well. And in last month's podcast, I mentioned the Civil War Soldiers and Sailors database in response to a question from a listener who was looking for a really good resource for Civil War sailors. Now, unfortunately, as I stressed in that episode, the percentage of sailors included is still fairly low in that database, unfortunately. So I was really pleased to see that there's a new collection on Fold3.com. And it's called the U.S. Navy Survivors. I will have a link in the show notes for that as a great follow-up to last episode. And nearly 2 million records are in this collection. They come from case files of approved pension applications between 1861 and 1910. So they include Civil War survivors and later Navy veterans until just before World War I. I love seeing all of these new record collections that appear online that, you know, kind of ever so gradually, they're filling in the gaps to help us find our ancestors. And if there's records that you're looking for, that you're waiting with bated breath to uh, come online, you'll definitely want to check out the Genealogy Gems blog because every Friday we blog about all the new record collections that are coming online that we are hearing about here at Genealogy Gems. 
And finally, there's another record set coming online that will just be huge for those indexing African American ancestors. Freedmen's Bureau records are finally being indexed. Anyone with African American roots or who has any Southern ancestors should really know about these records. The Freedmen's Bureau was organized after the Civil War to aid the newly freed slaves in 15 states and Washington, D.C. And destitute whites were also helped by the Freedmen's Bureau. Well, for several years, the Freedmen's Bureau created marriage records, labor contracts, and other records of families and their military service, poverty, property, health, and education. The richest documents are the field office records of each state. And a few field office records are already transcribed or indexed, so I'll have a link in the show notes to the Freedmen's Bureau online directory. And now FamilySearch and other national partners have issued a call to action for the genealogy community to help finish indexing them all, an estimated 1.5 million records within the coming year. A press release that they put out says, quote, records, histories, and stories will be available on discoverfreedmen.org. Additionally, the records will be showcased in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is currently under construction on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and expected to open in late 2016, unquote. So that is really neat that these genealogically valuable records are also so valuable historically that they will be featured in a national museum for everyone to learn from. That's wonderful. Again, for all the details on everything we've just talked about in the genealogy news, you can head to the show notes. You go to genealogygems.com, hover your mouse over podcast and go to genealogy gems podcast. And you are looking for episode 181. Click the link and you will find a whole web page dedicated to this episode. And it's going to have all the links for you. And of course, if you're using the Genealogy Gems podcast app, you'll find the show notes and the website links there as well. All right. Well, coming up next, we're going to hear from you. And that's going to be over at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter from that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me all the time Bring me a letter from my proud old dad that we are winning and I bet he's glad but more than any other a line from my old mother bring me a letter from my hometown You know, I love hearing from you about the gems that matter most to your genealogy research. And this month's mailbox is no exception. Recently, I heard from Patty, who says, Not long ago, I listened to the podcast in which you encouraged people to send their links to their genealogy blogs. And after seeing this week's newsletter, I thought I finally would. She says, I started a blog last summer to share my research with my family, which is fairly spread out throughout the country. I also wanted to document a trip to Italy that my husband and I took last October, which included genealogy research as well as the chance to meet newly discovered relatives there. My website is mydeadrelatives.net. Thanks for all the great info you provide. Well, you are so welcome, Patty. Love the name of your uh, blog, mydeadrelatives.net. And I have to say, I hear from so many people about the power of blogging your family history. I know I harp on it here on the show, but, you know, most people start because they're just bursting to share their family history finds, and they want to do it in those small little bite-sized pieces that work so well on a blog. 
And of course, many of them also hope to connect with other descendants who might stumble across their blogs and contact them. And you know, it really does happen. If you are ready to start blogging about your family history or just kind of get re-inspired to get back into it, be sure and check out the free Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast that we have on our website. I also have some videos dedicated to setting up a family history blog on our Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. You can watch those and uh, those are free. And we continue to hear feedback on the new Ancestry.com website. On the Genealogy Gems Facebook page, Cynthia told us, I absolutely love it. At first I was confused, but took the time to figure out how to find what I wanted and add new facts and photos. And it was a challenge, and, and now I will never go back to the old way. Also on Facebook, Paris told us that she misses the show how we're related feature with its icon. And Ken mentioned that uh, he misses now having the family group view. Nora also wrote in with more detailed comments on her three favorite features over at Ancestry.com. Here's her short list. Number one, that when you are given the option to accept hints, you now have yes, no, and maybe options. And I have to agree with uh, Nora on this. That's so much more practical to have a maybe option. Number two, she loves the life story view, especially since it gives the option of removing historical events that you don't want to include from an ancestor's timeline. And number three, she finds it easier to merge facts about the same life event when reported by multiple sources. Nora even uh, wrote in and shared her step-by-step -step tips for how she merges the facts on the new website. And uh, in our show notes for this episode 181, I have a link to her full comments, along with some helpful screenshots, if you'd like to follow along with her on that. And a third piece of a mail in the mailbox here comes from Carol in St. Louis, Missouri. She was frustrated that she couldn't read my entire email newsletter. She writes, would love to know what you are saying. But what she said was that the newsletter email that she gets doesn't fit in her email window. She says, I don't want to toggle to the right and to the end of each line and then have to toggle back. Have you ever run into that? I've seen that and I don't know for sure even why it happens, but occasionally you'll get an email and you have to toggle back and forth. It's, it's like the line extends too far. I don't blame her and being annoyed. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> well, the good news is, is that if you ever have trouble with any of our weekly Genealogy Gems newsletters showing up in your inbox and not fitting properly in your viewer on your screen, there's a really easy fix. You know, email sizing is actually related to your computer's screen resolution setting and a variety of other different variables that play into this, but it's really different for everyone. So in cases where it doesn't come through to your email account the right way, we do provide a link at the top of the email that you can simply click to view the email on a new web browser tab. And that should fit it really nicely on the page. So just look for that, that little, are you having trouble reading this? Click this link right at the top of the newsletter and it should open it up in a new tab for you and, and look great. And of course, to get the free Genealogy Gems email newsletter, just sign up in the box on genealogygems.com and we don't share your email address with anybody. Uh, you just get our weekly newsletter, comes out every Thursday, and you also get a free bonus when you do sign up for the newsletter. It's our free ebook on Google Tips and you get that just for signing up. Thanks to all of you for writing in and coming up next, we're gonna find your family in the fifties. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad who knows that we are winning and I'll bet he's glad for more than any other a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my home Sunny. Yes, I'm here. Now, Sunny, you know that I've done my homework and I've decided to trust all my digital files to Backblaze. They are now the official backup of Genealogy Gems. But this has got me wondering, what's been your backup plan so far? What have you done to make sure your files are safe and secure? 
Oh, well, you caught me out a little bit. I have to, I'm going to have to confess a few things. Okay. So I have a, f- a few different strategies that are really horrifying to admit, but I have to admit that when some floods came by in my area a little while ago, my best strategy was to keep my laptop off the floor. That's as oh, good no. as it got. And when I, I do, I'm the kind of person who worries about things. And so I think, okay, what, what's my fire plan? I'm going to grab my youngest child with one hand and I'm going to grab my laptop in the other oh, hand. And that's my plan for surviving a fire with all of my data intact. And that's not necessarily the best plan because I have two other kids. Yes. <laughs> and it sort of leaves them on their own. Yeah. But, and then, the, you know, the biggest one, there, there were a rash of thefts in my area recently, and I was concerned that somebody might walk in and grab my laptop. And I wasn't so worried about the hardware. It's an older laptop, but I was really worried about all the data that I wasn't sure if I had backed up properly. And so I'm not kidding you. My husband would laugh at me because every time I left the house, I would hide my laptop under a different pile of blankets. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's your plan? You know... I need to just put it out there, and you don't have to tell me how terrible it was. <laughs> tell me, please, that you've made some improvements, have you? Well, yes, I had made some improvements. I did start stashing copies of my important files in Dropbox, the really urgent big projects I was working on at the moment. Older photos and files I did back up online, and I did have an external hard drive that I was sort of iffy about using regularly, mm-hmm. and I did start using cloud-based email. But see, that doesn't protect all your files. And, and of course, when you're talking about external hard drives, that's the thing. They're mechanical, so they can break. Or they could be consumed in the same fire that takes your laptop. Yes, they could. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that doesn't help a lot because I don't have a third hand to grab the hard drive. <laughs> So, yeah, there were lots of holes in my data backup plan. And so I'll tell you, those holes became really clear to me a few weeks ago because my laptop got sick. So first it ran a fever, and then it shut down entirely. My computer repairman, who is wonderful, bless his heart, said to me very seriously, please tell me you have everything backed up. Yeah. I hesitated. Oh, no. (laughs) That crash took three days to resolve. It resulted in a prescription for a cooling fan Mm -hmm. and the dire news that my laptop is living on borrowed time. I was sternly instructed to back everything up because in those three days, I discovered I had considerable gaps in my backup plan. Fortunately, the timing of this was just really good because you had just announced Genealogy Gems' new partnership with Backblaze. I knew that if you could entrust thousands of audio, video, image, text, and all kinds of files to them... I could do the same with my files. And I wouldn't even have to put a whole lot of thought and a big plan into it. I could just do it. So I signed up for Backblaze. It's like five bucks a month, Lisa. Like exactly. Like 50 bucks a year. It's less than I spend on Redbox movies for my kids. <laughs> It took me this long to do this, and it was that easy to just have them do it. It did take Backblaze a few days to process my initial backup because I have over 120,000 files. But, you know, Backblaze is now running continuously in the background, and it continues to do so as I work. I think of it now as my, like, little Backblaze butler. It's waiting to tidy up after me and be there for me when I need it. And you know what? Backblaze will even back up the external drives that I still do have. And I picture my little Backblaze butler saying, no extra charge, madam. <laughs> so really, I do. I have this little mental image of my Backblaze butler who is taking care of everything so that I don't have to worry about it anymore. And Lisa, I'm happy to report I have stopped hiding my laptop under blankets when I leave the house. Oh, good. You know, that that's a perfect analogy is that little butler. And at least now you can put blankets back on the beds of your children where they belong. <laughs> it makes me also feel a whole lot better because you always have a zillion files that you're working on here for genealogy gems. And we definitely want the gems to keep on coming. So I'm glad to hear it. You know, if your backup plan needs a little help like Sonny's did, I hope that you will really seriously consider Backblaze. It's easy to sign up. It's comprehensive, and it's just a few dollars a month. So go to backblaze.com slash Lisa to get the best deal around right now and ensure that all your files, including your precious family history, is all safe and secure. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. At some point in the past, many, if not most, of our relatives spoke a different language than we do today. 
And that means that records about their lives were created in other languages, too, like church records in Latin, for example. Well, these language barriers can become huge brick walls in our genealogy research. We don't know how to translate ancestors' names, or we can't read the language that the record is written in. Well, MyHeritage.com has just launched a new technology. It's called Global Name Transition to address this problem. Now you can search for historical records at MyHeritage in one language and receive relevant results from other languages automatically translated for you. So let's say you're searching for the name Alex. The system will search for variations like Alessandro and Alejandro and even Sasha, which is a popular Russian nickname for Alexander. This technology is also integrated into MyHeritage matching technologies, so subscribers will begin receiving transliterated matches from other languages. The initial release of MyHeritage's global name translation works with English and most major European and Romance languages. That they can do this not just across languages, but also across diverse alphabets is mind-boggling. But I'm not surprised this is coming from MyHeritage. After all, one of their strengths that I love is their worldwide focus. Their platform serves over 40 languages, and their historical records and trees are arguably the most diverse available in the genealogy world. That's one reason that we are so proud that MyHeritage is a sponsor of the Genealogy Gems podcast, because our listeners and readers live all over the world and certainly have roots from all over the world. Head to MyHeritage.com and get started today for free. That's MyHeritage.com. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Book Club. I have to say, Lisa, this is one of my very, very favorite parts of what we do here at Genealogy Gems. It's so fun for me because I'm such a reader. What about you? Are you having fun with the book club? Oh, I'm loving it. And in fact, I I just got back from a a couple of uh, genealogical events and have people always telling me, oh my gosh, and I love the book club. They always throw that in. Oh my gosh, you know. So it's it's definitely resonating out there. And and some people have told me that they've already read some of the books that we've covered and they've just thoroughly enjoyed kind of that genealogical discussion of them and of course hearing from the authors, which is awesome. So I'm kind of excited because this quarter I'm kind of taking the lead on picking a book. Yes, you are. (laughs) I'm actually really excited about that. I am sort of, between the two of us, I'm the one who pushes her glasses up her nose and talks about books, Yeah, (laughs) quite frankly, right? (laughs) You're going to talk about technology and I'm going to talk about books. But what's been really fun is to see you get really excited about our next book and say, oh, Sunny, please, 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 let's do this book. (laughs) So, of course, and so I'm very pleased to let Lisa announce this month our third quarter book selection for the Genealogy Gems Book Club. Tell us about it, Lisa. Well, you know, Sunny, our new book club featured book certainly reaches into my childhood, and I'm certain that it will for many of the Gems listeners out there because Laura Ingalls Wilder captured the hearts and the minds of so many generations with her Little House books, right? But not that many people know that The Little House in the Big Woods was actually not Laura's first book. In fact, it was not even her first attempt at an autobiography, which I thought was interesting. So although The Little House books were technically fiction, you know, we think of them as kind of her autobiography. Laura certainly drew heavily from her childhood for those books. Well, Sometime around 1929 or 1930, after uh, she and Almanza moved into the Rocky Ridge Farm in Mansfield, Missouri, supposedly because they were going to have a nice quiet retirement, uh, (laughs) Laura went out and she bought a supply of 50-50 and Big Chief tablets and a bunch of number two lead pencils, and she began to write her childhood memories that spanned from the age of two to about 18. Now, she had been a columnist and an editor for the Missouri Ruralist. Um, that was from 1911 to 1924. So certainly writing wasn't new to her. And, of course, her, her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, was a famous author in her own right at that time. Well, in this book that we're going to have as our book club feature, Laura documents her family's experiences as pioneers in an American West that was fading away. So across the cover of this 
first book that she's gone to, to write back in the late 20s, early 30s, she scrawls across the front cover, Pioneer Girl. And unfortunately, the book never made it to print. The Little House books are clearly based on this Pioneer Girl book, um, although it's distinctly different because the Little House books are told in a child's voice. Right. Pioneer Girl is the adult Laura drawing from her recollections of family and neighbors, um, wagon trains and homesteads, and the newly published Pioneer Girl, the annotated autobiography by Laura Ingalls Wilder, which is edited by Pamela Smith-Hill, is our Genealogy Gems book club selection for the third quarter of 2015. Finally, we're going to get our hands on it. So I can hear you smile when you say this. I think that almost as long as I've known you, Lisa, I've known you are a true Laura Ingalls Wilder fan. What do you love about her story? Well, I think for me, I mean, as a child, I would read it and I just had this sense like somehow I was there with her. And I know so many people felt that way, but um, I don't know. It, that was one of the first little inklings for me that I wanted to know more about my family history. Is there any chance that my family has a history sort of like what she's describing in these books? And I'm a do-it-yourselfer, so it really thrilled me to read about how they made their own stuff and sewed their own clothes and made their own bacon and smoked it in the smokehouse and all the things that they did themselves I just thought was intriguing. Um, but now, of course, as an adult... I really have been ecstatic about reading these stories, but from her adult perspective, you know, written in that adult voice. And, and of course, with the book being edited by Pamela Smith Hill and uh, backed up with a whole, by a whole bunch of wonderful researchers, it's so much more than just the Pioneer Girl book that she wrote. It's all of the additional research and context. So, for me, the reason I kind of figured that uh, I and many of the other genealogists out there listening would love this is because of that immaculate research that goes into this book. And really, Sunny, I think it's a stunning example of source citation. I mean, when you see the book, it's, it's almost, I'd, I'd guess, a third of it is source citation. Uh, it consumes large portions of the pages. And it's just like this roadmap of other sources and books and uh, items that you could follow up with if you really want to continue to dig into uh, learning more about Laura Ingalls Wilder's life. And also, I think through the book, you'll find that there are never before seen pictures, you know, photographs. They're just sprinkled throughout the book. It's like you turn the page. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing Nellie Olson for the first time. The real Nellie Olson, not just um, Garth Williams' drawing of who Nellie Olson was. It brings all this research that was done, all the photographs, all the maps and documents. And even when it wasn't their horse or their clothing, They've got representative images to show you what does that look like in, in, in real photographs from that time period. And so it just absolutely brings the people and the times to life, I think, for everyone. Whether you're a big Laura Ingalls Wilder fan or not, I think you'll absolutely love it and revere it as a genealogical work and a historical work. It's really amazing. You know, as I hear you talk about why this is such a great read for genealogists, Lisa, it reminds me of all the conversations I've had with you where I've told you why this is such a great <laughs> read for genealogists. And it occurs to me that that's really one of the values of the Genealogy Gems Book Club. We're not just reading for pleasure. We look at these books as artifacts and how-tos and examples of how you know, they inform our telling of our family stories and they inspire them. They also teach us how to write them well. And we talk about that a lot, don't we? Look at how they annotate the sources. Look at how they bring in some of these um, social history pieces or the maps or the census uh, records that we found and things. And I think that it's almost like we use a lot of these stories, which we love on their own merits, we use them as workshop pieces to inspire how we share our own stories. Exactly. Uh, to me, that's what why we've put so much time into the selection process, because I just think it's riveting that the books that we've chosen can reach us on so many different levels. They're enjoyable. I mean, you read this book, and if you've read the Little House books, um, you're going to love seeing not only her adult perspective, but you're going to be stunned by some of the 
actual real life versions of the stories that you read about in the Little House books. They were fictionalized. She did make them appropriate for children in terms of her audience. And this book doesn't pull punches in that respect. So there's some some real stark realities of life in the Pioneer West that are just intriguing. Uh, But like you say, also the fact that, like with a lost ancestor, you read that and we really got a sense of how could you just weave a compelling story, even whether you decide to make it fictional or whether you want to make it completely based on um, fact, that you can take family stories and tell them in such compelling ways. I, I love seeing how authors do that. And um, I, I'm very happy to say that I've already had an opportunity uh, to uh, interview Pamela Smith-Hill, who was the, the editor on this amazing work, and her perspective on just the amount of work that was involved uh, and what she was looking for, all those things I think people are really going to enjoy hearing. Because you look at this book and you go, wow, that doesn't look that different than the stuff that I've collected over the years. I've got some maps. I've got some photos. I've got these stories. I've got the information that I've gleaned from documents. How amazing to be able to pull it all together. I mean, this a work like this for your own family would just be a treasure and an heirloom for, for generations to come. I mean, if you even to do a chapter of your family's life in this kind of a format, I think would be riveting. I, I don't want to overwhelm anybody to say, oh, we're all going to do it just the way they did it. Cause it, it's huge. I don't know how, I don't know how she finished it. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> really, I just, I look at like, how did you ever finally get done? Because it's, it's just a huge, beautiful hardcover book. So I like the idea of uh, looking at it, but maybe from the perspective of, I could tell a chapter or a story of my family in this kind of a format. And I think it would be, satisfying to the genealogist who wants that source citation and still compelling and and riveting as good storytelling to the non-genealogist in our life. Excellent. Well, I'm really excited to hear that interview. You know, um, I had to take a back seat on this one uh, <laughs> to have you do this, and I'm so glad I did because I, I can't wait to hear your conversation with Pamela Smith-Hill. That's going to be really fun, and that'll be in two months. Next month, we'll be back to talk about a little bit more about Pioneer Girl, but I will also add my recommendations for some of the books that I have loved, loved, loved over the years about the American West. I grew up with that on my radar, and I've got some great books to share with you, too. They're a little bit different, and I think that we'll have um, some great variety over the next couple of months, and Lisa and I will both be traveling to the great American West (laughs) within the next month or so. We'll be meeting up. (laughs) in the um, highlands of Utah for the BYU Genealogy and Family History Conference. Um, so this is on both of our minds right now, This uh, the wide expanse of the American frontier. So, And you know, um, Sunny, um, I'm looking at my calendar. I'm heading to Arkansas at the end of, of July this month. But as I get a little closer into uh, September, in early September, I'm heading to Springfield, Missouri, just a hop, skip, and a jump. From Mansfield, I'm going to be speaking at the Ozarks Conference, and I have my fingers crossed that I'm going to not only get a chance to to visit Rocky Ridge Farm, but maybe to bring a little taste of that to the podcast as well. Ooh, that'll be fun. I like that. Yes. We'll have to go on the road. (laughs) Take gems on the road. That's right. So follow our blog posts over the next couple of months. Um, Pick up a copy of The Pioneer Girl through the links on the Genealogy Gems website. We really appreciate it when you purchase books through our links because that helps support the free Genealogy Gems podcast and the material that we bring you over and over again on the blog and on the website and on our YouTube channel. We'll see you here back next month to talk more about the Genealogy Gems Book Club selection for the third quarter, Pioneer Girl, the Annotated Autobiography by Laura Inkles Wilder with help from her editor, Pamela Smith-Hill.
You know, I always advise people to keep their master family trees at home on their own computers, not online. The family tree software I recommend is Roots Magic, and I'm pleased to announce that Roots Magic 7 is out and it's better than ever. Now, what do I love most about this new update? It's got to be the automatic hinting feature. It's like Google Alerts for genealogy websites. Roots Magic now automatically searches sites like Family Search and MyHeritage for possible matches to your tree. You're going to see light bulb hints appear whenever a match is found. Clicking a light bulb will open a web browser with matching records. They've got new accounts that let you easily publish and maintain multiple trees online, whether publicly or privately. And data management is easy with the new data clean feature that helps you quickly find and fix possible problems with names and places. Or use the file compare feature to look at two different trees side by side and transfer information between them. These are just some of the dozens of new enhancements. You can give it a try right away with no risk with the free edition called Roots Magic 7 Essentials. So what are you waiting for? Go to rootsmagic.com. You'll see pretty quickly why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic. when I say these words. Sock hops, drive-ins, jukeboxes, fuzzy dice, letterman jackets, poodle skirts, bobby socks, and saddle shoes. How about 3D movies? Hula hoops, of course, the 1950s. Do you remember any of these fads or have you seen family pictures that show them? Of course, the 50s weren't all fun and games. Think the Korean War and the Iron Curtain. The 1950s was also a time of complex social problems and conflict throughout the world. Well, what about finding records about your fabulous family in the 1950s? You know, we're always told to start researching the most recent generations, but national censuses and many vital records have privacy blackouts. They're not available yet. So I want to mention four major resources for finding your family in the 1950s. First, Oral history interviews. Now, in many families, there's at least one person around who remembers the 1950s personally. It might even be you. But if there's not, then look to the memories of the next living generation who often know at least some important things about the past. Interviewing a relative is really one of the most fun and meaningful ways to learn your family history. After all, you're learning about the past firsthand or secondhand if you're asking about someone's parents. You can ask specific and personal questions of the kind that don't appear on a census record. You can really deepen your relationships with those you interview and gain a better understanding of the lives that led to you. The Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast has a great episode on interviewing your relatives, which I will have a link to in the show notes. And here are some tips that you can use for interviewing your family. Number one. Reach out with sincere interest in that person, not just the memories, of course, we're interested in those, but in the person themselves. Number two, be patient and respectful when you ask questions. It can take a while to establish a rapport and discover the kinds of memories that person most wants to share. And number three, the best skill that you can have is that of being a good listener. So don't interrupt. Don't judge and listen so intently that you can ask great follow-up questions. Now, people often ask me that when I'm interviewing people here on the podcast. Um, I will have questions prepared, but a big part of the interview process is the listening. And that's where I really find the gems. And as I listen, I can then formulate additional questions that really take advantage of the opportunity to explore a topic that maybe I didn't plan on and maybe they didn't plan on, but it can really turn out to be worthwhile. Next, newspapers are my second resource. Turn to these for more recent relatives obituaries and other articles that mention them. You can use hometown papers to discover more about a relative's daily life. 
current events that would affect them, popular opinions of the time, prices for everyday items, and more. And thanks to the internet, it is getting easier than ever to find your family members in newspapers. Some newspapers have been digitized, though it isn't as common with more recent newspapers that may still be under copyright protection. Still, you can use online resources to discover what newspapers served your family's neighborhood or even whether an ethnic, labor, or religious press would have mentioned them. Now, each country and region has its own online newspaper resources. Here in the U.S., I always start with the U.S. newspaper directory at Chronicling America. Now, in this case of research in the 50s, we're not going to start with searching the digitized papers because at Chronicling America, they only go up to 1922. But from the home page, click on U.S. Newspaper Directory, 1690 to present, and you'll get a fantastic search interface to locate all newspapers published in a particular place and time, as well as the names of libraries or archives that have copies of these papers. In the show notes, I'm going to have a link to Crown Clean America, as well as the British Newspaper Archive, the National Library of Australia Digitized Newspapers website, and the Newspaper Collection webpage for Library and Archives Canada. Remember, historical societies and even local public libraries are also wonderful places to look for newspaper holdings. City directories are the third place I look for for recent relatives. You know, by the 1950s, most towns and cities published directories of residents, mostly with telephone numbers. I use annual directory listings to track families from year to year. These might give you your first clue that someone moved, married, separated, divorced, or died. I can often find their exact street address, which is great for mapping them out, who lived at the house, and sometimes additional information like where they worked, what their job was, or who they worked for. You know, Ancestry.com has over a billion U.S. city directory entries online, clear up to 1989. But most other online city directory collections aren't so recent, probably for copyright reasons. Look for city directories first in hometown public libraries. I would call the library and see if there's a local history or genealogy room where they handle research requests. Also, check with larger regional or state libraries and major genealogical libraries. These are pretty straightforward research lookups and may not be that expensive to request copies of your relatives' listings in each year for a certain time period. The fourth and most fun place to look for relatives, I think, is in historical video footage. You know, YouTube isn't just for viral cat videos and footage of your favorite band. You can look for old newsreels, people's home movies, and other old footage that's been converted to digital format. It's not unusual to find videos showing the old family neighborhood, a school or community function, or other footage that's relevant to your relatives. Use the YouTube search box at youtube.com, just like you would the regular Google search box, because in actuality, it is powered by Google. So you can enter search terms like history, or the words old, footage, or film, along with the names places, or events that you are hoping to find. So for example, the name of a parade that your relative marched in, a a team that he played on, a company where she worked, a street he lived on, and the like. You know, it can be hit or miss for sure, but sometimes you can find something very special. You know, my contributing editor here at Genealogy Gems, Sonny Morton, didn't really believe me that YouTube could be a great source for family history finds. So when she was editing my book, she set out to prove me wrong. And I'm really glad that she did. Because almost immediately, with a search on the name of her husband's ancestral hometown and the word history, she had it in quotation marks, she found a 1937 newsreel with her husband's great-grandfather driving his fire truck with his dog. Can you believe that? And she recognized him immediately from old photos, and she'd even read about his dog in the newspapers. What a find. Her father-in-law was absolutely stunned because he had never met his own grandfather who died in 1950. 
So if you're interested in scouring YouTube for some of those kinds of finds, uh, you can certainly learn all about it uh, in the second edition of the Genealogist Google Toolbox. There's an entire chapter devoted to YouTube. So that's four places to look for 1950s relatives. So let's recap. In family memories, newspapers, city directories, and YouTube footage. So what about those 1950 and 1951 censuses around the world. Let's do a little spotlight on the 1950 U.S. Census. Well, the 1950 U.S. Census won't be released to the public until April of 2022. If you really need an entry on yourself or immediate relatives, you can apply to receive copies of individual census entries from 1950 all the way through 1910. Now, it's not cheap. It's a $65 per person per census year fee. But if you're having some research trouble that you think could be answered by a census entry, it might just be worth it. So check the show notes for a link to the page at census.gov that tells you how to do this. And it's called the Age Search Service. Ancestry.com does have a 1950 U.S. Census substitute database it's a little gimmicky because it appears to be just kind of a slice of their city directory collection from the mid-1940s to the mid-1950s. But this is still a really good starting point to target U.S. relatives during this time period. I have some interesting factoids on the 1951 censuses for England, Canada, and Australia, which aren't yet available to the public. At the Office for National Statistics website, you can at least download a blank form from the 1951 census in England, and I'll have a link for that in the show notes as well. That site says, quote, there was no census in 1941 and only limited population information from the 1939 National Register, making the 1951 census highly significant in tracking changes in society over 20 years. The 1951 census revealed that the population of Britain had exceeded 50 million. It was the first census to ask what household amenities, such as outside loos, <laughs> bathrooms for those of you in the U.S., um, as Britain began to clear slums and rebuild housing after World War II. Questions about fertility and duration of marriage were reinstated. The Registrar General for England and Wales, Sir George North, asked women to be more honest about their age. Many women at the time felt that questions relating to age were of a too personal nature. Information from previous censuses suggested that women had adjusted their age upwards if they married young and down if they married later. Editorial pages in newspapers and magazines were flooded with queries from distraught women fearful that their true age would become public knowledge, end quote. Of course, that's so funny to me now, as our age is a basic piece of all of our identifying records, but it was a big deal back then. So a good substitute for the 1951 census may be England's electoral registers, at least for those who were qualified to vote. An ancestor description of London electoral register states that Quote, registers typically provide a name and place of abode, and older registers may include a description of property and qualifications to vote. Registers were compiled at a local level, unquote. That webpage has some really helpful tips on searching registers by location through 1954. And again, check the show notes for a link. So what about Canada? They do censuses every 10 years on the years ending in the number one, also, and a population and agricultural census in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta every 10 years in the years ending in the number six, according to the Library and Archives Canada website. By law, you can't get personal information yet from post-1921 census returns, except about yourselves or for pension or other legal purposes. The site does say that third parties cannot obtain information about another individual without the individual's written consent, which leads me to wonder if you could get them if you did have consent, but that may not be easy or possible to get from the relatives that you're researching. You'll hit up against the same privacy issues in Australia for 1951, but what is online 
is the entire yearbook Australia for 1951, with free downloadable chapters on topics like land, transportation, communication, education, welfare, labor, wages, prices, the population, vital statistics, and several different types of industrial reports. You won't likely find any ancestors mentioned by name, but can read generally about how the country was doing at that time. So there you have it, your ancestors and your family history in the 1950s. There may be some barriers, but we do have just a few workarounds. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 181. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or leave a voicemail at the voicemail line 925-272-4021. And for all you premium members, boy, oh boy, have we got a fantastic new video for you. I'm actually really excited about this one because I had so much fun putting it together and I'm using so many of the strategies myself that I talk about in this video. It's called Enhance Your Genealogy with Evernote. This is not a beginner class. We've got lots of beginner sessions on the premium membership website at genealogygems.com. You can sign up and become a, a full-fledged Genealogy Gems premium member, which gives you access to all kinds of stuff on the premium side of the website. But this one is more of an intermediate to advanced session. This is taking it to the next step. And I've got 10 projects for you in this session that really take advantage of Evernote's strengths. And I think are really going to meet a lot of the needs that you've been having. And you might not have even known it or realized that Evernote could handle these for you. So check that out. Make sure you sign in to your membership and go check out the Enhance Your Genealogy with Evernote, 10 projects that you can do. I think you're going to like it. And before I let you go, I just have to tell you, I, I love hearing so much from all of you out there. And uh, recently, Jennifer Pena, who has written in, we've shared some of her emails here on the show. She's been a long time Genealogy Gems Premium member and even helped us out. We need a little few, few extra hands at Roots Tech this last year, and she helped us out there. She's just been a great friend of the show. And she wrote me because she was so excited that she had gotten an Amazon Echo. Have you heard of this thing? It's really kind of cool. She sent me an email, gave me the whole description. And, and basically, this is kind of the next step in the internet. They call it the internet of things, taking the power of the internet and the cloud and focusing it kind of running it through household objects. And Echo is like Siri for your house, kind of is the best way I can put it. It looks like a, um, like a black tube. I don't know if a tube is the right word. It's about a foot high. It's maybe, maybe, you know, four or five inches in diameter. It, and it, it looks like a canister of, of types, you know, and you have it on your, sitting on your counter and you plug her in and you hook her up to the internet. I say her because you call her Alexa. Uh, you can call it Amazon or Alexa, but the echo responds to your voice. So uh, I have a video in the show notes because you got to check this out. And I know that um, initially the Echo was only made available to Prime members and only by invitation. So we're talking about Amazon Prime here where you pay a yearly fee and you get uh, the free shipping and that all good stuff. So Jennifer is a Prime member and she knew I was too. And she said, oh, this is kind of neat. I thought it was kind of gadgety, but now I'm really using it. And it's the Amazon Echo. Well, of course, I couldn't resist, right? So I am a Prime member. I put in a request for an invitation and I got it several months ago. And I just got my Amazon Echo a couple of weeks ago. So I plugged it in in the kitchen and you can say its name, Alexa. So you say Alexa and you can say play the radio or you can even specify music because it's tied into Amazon Prime, right? So I like the band Heart. I can say, Alexa, play Heart. And she plays Heart. <laughs> kind of cool. Okay, so 
It has this prime music collection. It's free music that it can respond and give you kind of a playlist, a bit like Pandora, if you've ever used Pandora. So I'm thinking, okay, that's great, but I don't actually don't listen to music that much around the house because I'm usually busy podcasting and things like that. But you can also do things like Alexa, add bananas to the shopping list. Alexa, put record episode 181 on my to-do list. You get the idea. And it's tied to an app on my smartphone and my iPad. I know, I am totally geeking out. So you look at the app and you can go to the store and pull up the Echo app and there is the to-do list or the shopping list that you have been, as you think of things, telling Alexa to put these things on the list. You can ask her what the weather is, what the news updates are. And you can imagine they're adding more and more commands all the time. Now, if you don't want to call her Alexa, you can call her Amazon. (laughs) Call it Amazon. How about that? But how does this tie into family history? Well, the thing was, I'm standing here in the kitchen and I'm messing with this and I, I'm going through the checklist of what you can tell Alexa and I'm just loving it because so often I can't find a pen. I can't find the shopping list. I, I think of something and you know what it's like. It's gone out of your head. So I'm, I'm really enjoying this. And in fact, over the 4th of July holiday, I said, Alexa, play John Philip Sousa. And she, played the accompaniment to all of our fireworks. Well, as I'm standing here in the kitchen and I'm doing this, my, my husband walks in and he said, oh my gosh, I can so tell that you are related to your Uncle Buzz. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a DNA thing? What is this? This is a genetic thing? Because my husband, when we moved out to Texas, he had to commute back and forth between the Bay Area and Texas for about six months as he was wrapping up his job and then coming out here to to join me and genealogy gems, which is awesome. So he spent a lot of time. He was living at my uncle Buzz's house. Now, uncle Buzz is fabulous. Uh, He's my mother's brother and her younger brother. He walked me down the aisle when I got married. He's uh, always been an important part of my life, uh, an integral part of our family and certainly for my kids as well. So it was kind of fun that he and my husband got a chance to uh, live together for six months and get to know each other. And he said, oh, my gosh, Buzz has all the newest gadgets. He's got three iPads. He's got, you know, he's doing Chromecast. He's doing all these things. He's going to flip when you tell him about this Echo. And I got to thinking back through you know, back to childhood and all the times Uncle Buzz would come and visit and drive up in his van and he'd always have a new gadget. He had like the first CB radio. He had the newest, um, you know, when the Walkman came out, he always had whatever the new gadgets were. And although he wouldn't consider himself really techie, he's kind of, he's techie like I'm techie in that uh, I'll go for it if it seems like it fits a need and kind of excites my fancy and, and, and I see a creative use for something. Um, but it's not just tech for the sake of tech. And anyway, I just thought it was funny that my Amazon Echo kind of brought to the light that um, there is kind of a, a tech bent in my DNA, in my family. And certainly that just reaffirms the connection I have with my, my wonderful Uncle Buzz. I'd be interested to know, have you ever noticed characteristics in yourself and then you spot it in an older relative? or even better, an ancestor, and you go, I didn't know we had this in common. I, I'll never forget um, discovering my grandmother had been in all of these plays in theater in uh, high school. She'd never mentioned it to me, but she'd always been so supportive of me being in theater when I was in high school and college, and she would drive all the way from California up to Washington State to come and see me in a play. And then years later, I'm doing research and I see in the 1920s that she's in all the theater plays at school. It was, it was really a neat connection and a reaffirmation, I guess, of why I'm so passionate about family history. So I'd be interested to hear from you. Maybe you could head over to the the Facebook page, the Genealogy Gems Facebook page, or drop me an email. How about call up the voicemail line and leave a voicemail and let me know your story. What have been the connections in your family that have been fun and pleasant surprises. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.